Okay. Your bell keeps ringing. <laughs> cool. Okay. Tech support puppy isn't going to bark tonight. That's a good thing. <laughs> Looks like we got just about everybody, and we got a lot to talk about once again. So uh, let's get the show on the road. There we go. All right, hang on. <laughs> I'm gonna start this from the beginning. Yeah, you know, what? you've heard the song, <laughs> you know how it goes. We have um, these are things to talk about. Um, and we're going to get started as we do with a review of this past week's column, which um, maybe you had a chance to see it. We talked about white snake root and the inspiration for that column actually started with a walk in my backyard. I could see something you know, from the back door that um, I don't remember planting, but actually most of the things in my yard I don't remember planting. They've come up uh, from squirrels, they've come up from birds, um, you know, the, the pokeweed, the hackberries. Uh, Amazingly enough, I've never had poison ivy show up, which you'd think with all the birds that come through the yard that uh, that would have come up at some point, but it didn't. Um, and I saw this, this white plant blooming and I thought, is that what I think it is? Now, back um, when I used to work at Red Oak Nature Center, this was a plant that we saw all the time because it's a woodland plant. Um, it is called white snake root. And it's actually one of the plants that um, is one of the first learns I learned about interpretation. Now, you know, interpretation is um, what a lot of naturalists do. It's it sounds um, about interpreters who you know interpret a different language. Well, um, natural history interpreters will take uh, something like say a plant. And rather than just saying, this is white snake root and moving on, they learn to tell little stories about it. And the, uh, this is one of the first plants I learned about it. And one of the first things I learned about this plant was white snake root is rumored to be the plant that killed Abraham Lincoln's mom. That's the kind of plant that, I mean, that's the kind of fact that, that sticks in your head. Um, and it was a plant, like, as, I, uh, as I worked at, at Red Oak, I became quite familiar with. It's neat because it's a late blooming plant. So, you know, just when things are starting to turn yellow and brown, um, in fact, most woodland plants uh, finish their bloom cycles long before um, the, the spring ephemerals, as we call them, those woodland wildflowers. Usually their uh, peak season is before the leaves come out on the tree. So we're talking April and very early May. So to have something blooming in the woods in uh, August and September, that in itself is kind of unique. And then to have a notorious reputation as you know, something that killed people, that's uh, really quite something as well. So um, uh, to, to see this plant in my yard, though, I was a little befuddled because I didn't know. It, I thought, you know, I know this plant so well, but I realized I didn't know how it disperses. Now, uh, every plant has a means of moving around. It has to because if it just uh, had its flowers turn into seeds and those seeds fell right where they were, the, the, the species wouldn't succeed. It would crowd itself out and it would be done. So you know, some plants, they, uh, they move their seeds around, as I mentioned earlier, through birds. The, the birds eat the seeds and then they drop the seeds here and there. Um, and the plants move around that way. Some plants uh, have seeds that float, um, plants that uh, grow near water. Coconut is one. <laughs> um, 
we've got around here, we've got things like American Lotus and um, some of our lilies, water lilies. Uh, and then we have our plants that are dispersed by air. Probably the most famous one, it's not a native plant, but we all know what uh, a dandelion looks like. We've all blown on those seed heads and dispersed those seeds in the wind. Another a native example of that would be milkweed. The milkweed pods are ripening now and won't be too much longer. They'll be popping open and those seeds are gonna parachute their way through the air and land in different spots. And uh, we'll get uh, you know, milkweeds everywhere. Well, it turns out white snake root is actually dispersed by wind as well. So all these little flowers here, when they go to seed, they're gonna turn into tiny little uh, wind-blown parachutes and um, it's, uh, we're gonna get more white snake roots. So I, I spent the past week trying to figure out where the wind-blown white snake root seeds that landed in my yard came from, and I still haven't figured it out. I, I live right in, uh, very near downtown St. Charles, right in the middle of town. I'm not really near any woods. Um, so I, I haven't quite figured that piece of the puzzle out, although I did get a call from a, a reader who lives, um, I don't know, about four blocks from me, and she found it growing in her yard as well. And in fact, she called, she wanted to know if she should remove it or not, because uh, when I wrote about this plant, the, um, uh, the word I used was notorious, and she saw that, and she, she called me to say, is this something I should even leave growing? Well, these days it's fine. Uh, we'll get, uh, in a few minutes, we'll get into the, the notorious part of this plant's history. Uh, but I first wanted to show you what I was looking at to figure out that it was white snake root. Um, we've got some look-alike plants around here. Uh, now here on uh, the left, we have common bone set, um, Eupatorium perfoliatum. Now, uh, not too very long ago, uh, white snake root was also in the same genus of Eupatorium. But um, lately it's been broken off. Um, this uh, edger, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the, um, the Latin name of it, edgertorium, um, is from the Greek word that means long lived. Um, and it refers to the way these blossoms stay on the plant for a very long time. Um, the bone set, a uh, quick and dirty way to tell the difference between bone set. Uh, and this is uh, talking about common bone set and um, white snake root. You can see the blossoms do look kind of similar, but look at the leaves of common bone set. Um, perfoliatum refers to the way they grow. It looks like the stem is growing right through the middle of the leaf or like the leaf is clasping both sides of the stem. Uh, perfoliate is a, um, I guess it's a botanical term, but it refers to how the plant grows. And that's a, a giveaway when we're looking at common bone set uh, versus white snake root. You can see the white snake root leaf is kind of arrow shaped. It has a long stem. It does not clasp the stem the way um, the bone set leaf does. And then also the habitat is a giveaway. Common bone set, uh, it likes to grow where things are kind of wet. And, um, White snake root, it's, it's pretty adaptable, but it is considered a woodland wildflower. So um, the habitat and the growth habit, uh, the way the leaves grow, those are two ways to tell these two plants apart. Um, and uh, there's um, the uh, leaf miner. See this, uh, these wiggly lines here on this leaf on the white snake root? Um, Leaf miners are, are tiny little insects. Uh, you've probably seen this on other plants as well, but they make their living inside the tissue of the leaf. And you can see as they feed, they live, leave a little trail. Uh, this particular leaf miner is um, very particular. It only lives on white snake root. And so if you see an arrow-shaped leaf uh, with a long stem, and it's got lines on it like that, you can be pretty sure that you are looking at the leaf of white snake root. Uh, now we do have another bone set in our area. Uh, we've actually, we've got a few, but this is the other uh, more common one, tall bone set. This is considered a prairie plant. 
um, you can see it's got, its leaves are not perfoliate. They do not uh, look as though the stem is growing through the middle of them. Uh, and again, the habitat is a giveaway too, because prairie and a woodland, pretty easy to tell them apart. So tall bone set um, is also, it's another Eupatorium altissimum, uh, refers to its tall growth habit. Um, and it's, uh, used to be considered part of the same genus um, as white snake root, and now they've, they've split them apart. These taxonomists, we're going to do a little thing on taxonomy in a little bit, but people are always either trying to lump things together or split things apart, and in this case, they split these two plants into separate uh, genera. Now, the notorious part of white snake root's history, uh, the part about it killing Abraham Lincoln's mom, it didn't outright, you know, just go up to her one day and, you know, rub up against her and kill her. Um, the thing with white snake root is that it's got a toxin inside of it, a toxic chemical called tremetol. Um, and it's a, it's a chemical that uh, when it is ingested, it can cause um, tremors, it causes a pretty violent gastric response, you know, sick stomach. Um, uh, people get, um, you know, very, very ill, and then they fall into a coma. And a um, long time ago, they didn't survive. And Abraham Lincoln's mom, you can see here on her headstone, she only lived to be 35 years of age. Uh, you might recall if, uh, from history books that the Lincoln family wasn't always in Illinois. They did uh, come west and they spent some time in Kentucky. Well, um, Nancy Hanks Lincoln uh, was uh, known as being a very uh, caring sort of a person. And uh, these settlers, as they moved, um, they would you know, form these small settlements. A lot of them did get sick. It, um, some of the causes, uh, back then were cholera, uh, dysentery, malaria, things that we hear about what we're fortunate today that we don't really have to deal with. But uh, people would have to, uh, especially out on the frontier, there wasn't usually uh, a doctor nearby. They would have to care for each other. And Nancy Hanks Lincoln uh, cared for some of the other people in their uh, little settlement there. Um, and now she, she didn't, there's two thoughts of what happened to uh, Nancy Hanks Lincoln. Um, the most common thinking is that she did die from milk sickness. You will find some references saying that she may have died from consumption, which uh, we know today is tuberculosis. Um, historians point to some of her features, um, saying that she had skin typical of um, uh, what you would expect uh, someone to have uh, poor um, lung capacity might have. Um, so there's, there's not a hundred percent consensus that she did die of milk sickness, but that is the most common reason given for her death at that young age. Milk sickness, as it turns out, it killed thousands of settlers and it was a, a disease that really baffled um, pioneers as they headed west because it didn't have the symptoms that they become familiar with from those other diseases like uh, dysentery, cholera, uh, uh, smallpox was another big concern back then. This was something that didn't really occur back in the East where they came from because uh, white snake root didn't grow as commonly there. And it also, um, the, the way it was transferred was the, the cow uh, that settlers would usually bring with them as they head west, uh, would forage. And if uh, the, the pasture areas were not cleared, if they were still in woods as opposed to open grassland areas, uh, the cows could consume that um, white snake root. And it really poisoned the milk. If their calves would drink it, they would die. Sometimes the cows themselves would die. Uh, but that chemical um, would transfer into the milk and uh, make people really, really sick. So this went on um, for a 
a, a lot, it was a big problem for our uh, pioneers. Uh, it wasn't until, um, well, and, and to be perfectly honest, even after it was figured out, people were still dying from it because the plant would grow in places that they didn't realize and their animals would still forage on it. But um, this was a frontier woman, um, a frontier doctor named Dr. Uh, at the time she made the discovery, her name was Hobbs. She later remarried uh, a gentleman named Bixby, who has a whole other fascinating story. But she was... Um, uh, a young, as a young woman, uh, her family had moved west. She had actually was born in Philadelphia, but they settled down here in southern Illinois, uh, down in Hardin County. Uh, if you've ever traveled down that way, uh, you know Hardin County is down in the, the Shawnee uh, National Forest, what we know now is the Shawnee National Forest. Well, um, she was very concerned. Uh, in fact, she even lost family members to milk sickness. She actually went back east to obtain a medical degree before uh, coming back to Illinois. And she uh, wanted to try and figure out what this disease was because it wasn't matching the profile of these other common diseases. And it seemed to be very exclusive to the areas of Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Illinois, where people were moving to. Um, well, where she lived down here in southern Illinois, um, the town that she lived in, I don't know if it actually exists anymore. It was called Rock Creek, but it's actually very near a place uh, we know today as uh, Cave in Rock, Illinois, down here on the Ohio River. Uh, well, this area uh, used to be home to the uh, Shawnee uh, Native American tribe. And as the Shawnee were pushed out, uh, not all of them left. And one of the people who stayed behind was an old medicine woman. Uh, now, legend has it that the people of Rock Creek called this woman Aunt Shawnee. Uh, but she and uh, Dr. Anna uh, became friends. And as Dr. Anna was trying to solve this mystery, uh, Aunt Shawnee said, oh, well, I know of a plant that would you know, make our people sick and we learn to avoid. And they, they actually, I believe they did have a medicinal use for it where they were able to do something with the root. But don't, don't quote me on that and don't go trying to make medicine on a white snake root. But um, the two of them uh, worked together to identify white snake root as the, uh, the cause of milk sickness. Um, Dr. Anna wrote a paper and she sent it back east. And now whether this was, this was in the you know, early 1800s or 1818, 1820, uh, was shortly after Illinois had become a state. And you know, whether uh, it got lost in mail service uh, was not great back then, uh, deliveries oftentimes got lost, or whether it was the fact that this uh, paper was written by uh, a young female frontier doctor, um, the uh, it was never fully recognized at the time. At the time, it was really needed. It wasn't until like 1928 that uh, the medical community uh, said definitively that white snake root was the cause of uh, milk sickness. Um, and it's just it's a it's a neat story. She's a neat woman. If you have time to to uh, do any online research or go to a library and learn more about her. She did uh, remarry. Uh, after she married Mr. Hobbs, she married Mr. Bixby, and he has a whole fascinating story. Uh, of, he was rumored to be a river pirate. In fact, there's a persistent legend down in southern Illinois about uh, Dr. Anna's having uh, hidden uh, a treasure in one of the many caves that are in that part of our state. Nobody's ever found it, but there is this persistent story that she took um, her uh, river pirate husband, some of his uh, treasure and buried it somewhere in a cave down in Southern Illinois. Um, and the fact that, that um, the connection between white snake root and milk sickness wasn't well-defined for a very long period of time um, makes me wonder uh, how many thousands of settlers really died from this illness. In fact, I even did a little digging uh, in my own side of the family. Uh, I found that um, 
my, my mom's family is from central Illinois, and they actually followed a path similar to Lincoln's family. They came west, they came through Kentucky, they came up through southern Illinois, and they settled um, in north central, uh, northwest central Illinois in Menard County, which is uh, somewhere in here, probably right behind where the picture is. Um, Morgan County, yeah. And um, my grandmother, my mom's mom, had a baby sister who died in 1907. And I, I looked up her uh, death record. She was a year and 10 months old, little Fanny Esther Boker. And her cause of death was listed as acute gastroenteritis. Now, Lots of things could have caused that. Um, milk sickness. I looked through a lot of death records. Uh, the, the Menard County death records that I could find online were from uh, the 1880s to about 1910 or so. And um, there was a lot of people that had that listed as the cause of death, and there was no mention of milk sickness anywhere in there. So I, I, I can't say this for sure, but I just kind of wonder, knowing where that farm was, uh, knowing that there was a large section of timber, knowing that uh, they had uh, a couple of dairy cows. I remember my grandma talking about growing up there and, you know, letting the cows roam and she'd have to go into the woods to haul them back up. I just wonder, you know, did little Fanny Esther Boker, did one of my ancestors die of milk sickness? I'm sure if it wasn't her, I'm sure others did because it was so very, very common back then. But uh, white snake root is... Um, it's still a plant that's uh, among us today. Milk sickness is not really uh, amongst us today. Even, um, I, I suppose there might be uh, isolated cases, um, but the, the thing now with modern dairy practices, most milks are combined. So even if a cow did eat some white snake root, it would be diluted uh, amongst the thousands of gallons from other cows. So it's, it's not something that's a concern today, but the plant still has the chemical and you still uh, want to make sure that it does not grow where um, uh, dairy animals might be foraging. So um, check it out. It's, it's blooming right now. Um, like its scientific name tells us, the blooms last for quite a while. Uh, the, the, sort of the, say a few minutes ago, the woman that lives a few blocks from me who called uh, notice that it's growing out in front of her house and she wants to know should she cut it down is it a dangerous plant uh, I told her no go ahead and leave it or if she doesn't want to end up with lots of white snake root because it does spread pretty aggressively those seeds do um, those flowers produce a lot of seeds to just you know cut the flowers off take them in put them in a vase enjoy them in the house but uh, it's a neat plant it's happening right now uh, something else that's happening right now, I, I came across this plant on the left when I was at Potawatomi Park the other day. It was uh, laying on, on one of the paths there by uh, a Riverview Mini Golf, and it caught my eye because of these cool little growths on here. Um, oak trees, I don't know if you've ever looked closely at oak leaves. Um, a lot of them are perfect, and there's a lot of them that aren't. Um, Oak trees are, are one of many different plants that supports uh, galls. And a, a gall, what a gall is, is a structure of, um, I don't know what that is. Um, it's usually caused, it's caused by uh, usually an insect, some sort of outside um, uh, element, usually an insect um, that will lay its eggs on the leaf. And the, um, either the egg or the developing larva will uh, cause the release of a growth hormone that um, produces all these crazy kind of structures. Uh, this one that I saw at Potawatomi, uh, some people call it the fuzzy oak gall, some call it the furry oak gall. Um, this one in the middle, uh, the oak apple gall, uh, these I love finding these. They're, they're, they're about the size of a golf ball. So they really dominate the leaf that they're growing on. Um, and they're, they're, they're kind of fragile. I've tried to uh, you know, have one. In fact, I wanted to have one to show you tonight. And I, I knew where I'd stored one. And when I got it out, I realized that it had 
crumbled and fallen apart. So don't have one to show you. Um, and then the, the oak bullet gall over here, uh, you'll notice these two, the, the fuzzy gall and the apple gall grow on the leaf. The oak bullet gall tends to grow on the stem of the plant. Looking here at this oak apple gall, see that little circle there? That tells us that the developing insect that lived inside has exited and is no longer there anymore. I don't know where the exit holes on these furry oak galls would be. This actually, this leaf fell before uh, these fuzzy oak galls detached themselves. These are galls that will develop um, off of the plant uh, after fall comes the developing larvae inside will actually spend uh, the winter on the, uh, the forest floor or at Potolotomy's case the, the brick floor near there by mini golf um, and then the, the fully developed insects will emerge next year um, so I, I'm there's and there's there's lots of, of other types of galls as well. Maybe in subsequent weeks we can look at some of the more obvious galls we have on other plants. But right now is a time you can see these cool structures on the oak leaves. To, just to give you an idea of the the cycle that these go through, the insect comes and lays the egg. Um, the plant is stimulated uh, with a, a growth hormone to to make these crazy structures. The larvae then live inside and feed off of the material that's inside. I had a friend that once described this as um, saying, you know, imagine that uh, you're born inside of your favorite food, like a big chocolate cake or a pizza or something, and your job is to just eat your way through that. Uh, that's what these insects do. And um, I found this picture. I, I can't claim to have taken it, uh, but this was um, uh, from a... Uh, uh, extension uh, website showing the size of the wasp that's responsible for um, one of the galls. I believe this is the oak apple gall wasp, but most of the insects that make these galls aren't very large, even though the structures themselves are. Um, yeah, this is a, a little bit bigger than a grain of rice and it produces a gall that's about the size of a golf ball. So uh, neat little things happening right now. And um, next time you're buying an oak tree, see if you can see uh, the, the, uh, the galls that um, more than likely will have be on at least some of the leaves that you can see. Really cool stuff. Now, um, let's see. Um, this picture on the left I snapped, we were doing a program a couple of weeks ago on spiders. And uh, this was over at Creek Bend Nature Center at Leroy Oaks. Uh, it was actually kind of a rainy Saturday. Remember that one? Um, and I was admiring the, uh, the seed pods on the milkweed. And then I looked a little closer and I thought, ah, something's looking back at me. This is a Chinese uh, mantid or Chinese praying mantis. Um, this... Uh, one on the left, Kim Haig, I'm not sure if you're here tonight, but if you are, you snapped this picture last fall out at Otter Creek Bend, Wetland Park. The Chinese mantid is our primary um, praying mantis species in this area. We don't have the Carolina mantis, which would be the native species here in Illinois. It occurs a little bit further south from where we are. Um, and the, the Chinese mantid was, was introduced here in the States on purpose. Uh, a lot of people look uh, to praying mantises for their insect controlling um, abilities. Used to be able, and in fact, you can still buy them online. You can buy a mantid egg case, put it out in your garden. And um, it's, they're, they're touted, they're sold as being a chemical free way of controlling insect pests. And that, that's all well and good. They do eat a lot of insect pests, but they're also, they're kind of um, indiscriminate in the things that they eat. They, they grow quite large. These Chinese mantids can, gosh, a female can get to be, I don't know, six or eight inches long. Uh, very, very large. Um, very, very strong. When you look at how they're, they're built here. So here's her, um, her forelimbs here. Uh, she is uh, built 
to uh, built as a supreme predator, these arms can extend very quickly. There's a spine inside each one of the forelimbs, and that's what she uses to pierce and, and hold on to her prey, which nine times out of a out of 10 is an insect. Um, there's some kind of famous pictures online of Chinese mantids hanging out by hummingbird feeders. And yes, they actually can grab and hold on to um, a little hummingbird. I'm, I suspect it might be, you know, weakened hummingbird um, that wouldn't be able to fight off um, a big bug like this. Um, I also was a little horrified to learn that they are, uh, have been known to eat baby snakes. There's a, uh, a project going on up in uh, Lake County uh, where the uh, wildlife biologists there are, are reintroducing a tiny little snake called the a smooth green snake. Uh, even as adults, uh, green snakes aren't even uh, two feet long and the babies are, are quite small. Um, and the, uh, the wildlife biologist uh, who's heading up that project is Allison Sasser Dodi Vallat. Those of you who are frog monitors, you might recognize her name because she also heads up the uh, calling frog survey for this area. Uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Allison will uh, release these neonate green snakes and then they go back and they, you know, they, they check on how the babies are doing. Well, during one of their surveys, they found a Chinese mantid feeding on one of these uh, rare and, and somewhat fragile uh, baby green snakes. So um, judge for yourself, you know, they, they are really cool and they do eat other insects, but um, they also eat some things that uh, are, are um, not, um, not good food, anyway, things that they shouldn't be eating, let's put it that way. Um, as we get into uh, winter time, if you're out and about, uh, especially in, in grassland areas, look on the stems uh, that are still standing, uh, say goldenrod. Uh, I've found these on, on small shrubs as well. This is the egg case of the Chinese mantid. Uh, it looks a little bit like uh, a toasted marshmallow, and it's about the size of a toasted marshmallow. Uh, inside this case, there can be uh, 200, sometimes more than that, little baby mantids. Uh, this was one, I always tell people, these things make great pets. You can bring these inside. Sometimes they hatch, sometimes they don't. The shock of coming from the outdoors inside uh, sometimes kills them. Our indoor environments are also much drier. Um, it's, it's hard to raise baby insects indoors, uh, given our lack of humidity compared to the outside conditions. But um, these things, uh, sometimes it's kind of scary to find, you know, when you start, when you train your eye to see them, it's kind of scary to realize how many there are out there. Um, in fact, this photo on the left, this was sent uh, to me by a reader who found it in her garden, didn't know what it was. When she found out what it was, she went back out and looked. She found seven more just in her yard. So um, a, a female can produce more than one at the, uh, towards the end of her growing season, which is coming up now. They usually don't survive a heavy frost. So the adult um, mantids will be dying off soon. These cases uh, will overwinter and then the springtime they hatch. So this photo on the right, this was um, a young Chinese mantid that we raised at Hickory Knolls uh, a few years ago. I named him Manny. And you'll notice um, he's only got one uh, forelimb there. He's got a little stump here where the other one was. I made the mistake one night, uh, realized I needed to get some food for Manny. Uh, we had been finding little uh, seed moths uh, from the bird seed and I, we'd run out of those. Well, I found in, uh, some ants, so I put some ants in there. And that's when I learned ants fight back. So one of the ants uh, clipped off one of his uh, forelimbs and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, he's doomed. He's never going to be able to survive. You know what? He wasn't doomed. He survived just fine. He grew to his full mature size. He did turn out to be a male, so he didn't produce an egg sac, uh, egg case, but um, 
uh, it was a, another testament to just how strong these insects are and how good they are at surviving. Um, so yeah, consider that this winter, there's, there's no laws preventing you from collecting these egg cases. And so there they are an introduced species. In fact, there's a couple of professors at uh, St. Xavier University that were doing a study down at um, Daywin, the, uh, uh, the prairie that's down in where the uh, old Joliet Arsenal used to be down in, uh, I think that's Wilmington, Illinois. Um, they were seeing uh, what if the Chinese mantids were having an impact on our native spiders, like those Argiope spiders we talked about last week. I haven't seen the study. I, it, I think it's still going on, um, so there's no data that's that's available on that. But um, they are introduced, and they do eat things that they we kind of wish they wouldn't. Uh, so it's just a, a thing to be uh, on the lookout for this fall and and this winter. Now we do have one other species around here that's also introduced. This is the European mantis. And at least here in St. Charles, it doesn't seem to be as common as the Chinese mantis. Although I, I did find one, um, it had been run over. It was uh, out in front of our, our nature center, out at, at Hickory Knolls. And the reason I knew it was a European mantis was this little bullseye mark here on the inner um, uh, part of the the forelimb, there's this black and white circular mark. Uh, it's on both sides, and it's a uh, dead giveaway that it's a European mantis and not the Chinese mantis. Now, um, these guys too, they tend to be a little bit smaller, though like I said, those Chinese, those female Chinese mantids can get to be sometimes eight inches long. Uh, the, the Europeans, uh, even the females, are a little bit smaller. And then over here on the right, you see the, uh, the egg case is a different shape as well. It's more oblong, um, and it's got uh, these striations here where um, the egg cells are. Um, they are around here. Uh, they're, they're not quite as common, but uh, they are something else to look out for. Maybe you'll Get lucky find an egg case of each maybe you could have two pets next spring this photo uh, this was uh, courtesy of another uh, extension website uh, gives a great view of how the, that spine works to um, uh, grasp and pierce the prey in fact it'll pierce your skin too so be kind of careful if you're if you're picking up one of the adults because you can get a nice little poke um, well that's a nice little poke but uh, they, these guys are, are uh, we're starting to see them now uh, in various places. Keep an eye out for them um, and uh, uh, appreciate them for what they are, but also keep in mind that they are introduced in our area. So you know, we talked last week about the jack-o'-lantern fungus. This week I got, this is a, a cool photo that uh, Barb Rask, she's part of King County Audubon, she emailed this in. Um, this is an Earth Star uh, fungus. Now we've got lots of different kinds of earth stars in Illinois. Uh, it's called that because the outer skin um, or covering of the mushroom, as it grows, this pops away and it forms a kind of a star shape around the inner part of the mushroom. And then this hole right here in the middle, that's where it releases its spores. You know, mushrooms, uh, fungi, uh, they are not plants, so they don't have uh, um, roots and they don't have seeds, but they have structures that are similar. They've got mycelia that are underneath the ground that um, help nourish the fungus. This is the fruiting body that appears, and the spores are the way that the uh, fungi uh, reproduce and spread. Um, I thought this would be a neat opportunity to tackle just very lightly the topic of taxonomy. Now, it's not the most exciting topic. Um, it's, it can actually get very technical. And like I said earlier, the taxonomists are constantly lumping and splitting things that um, it's, it, taxonomy in its most basic sense is a means of classifying organisms. And I learned this neat little device years ago. Those of you who have come to classes I teach, I use this all the time. You can um, 
remember how things are classified by remembering that King Philip came over for good spaghetti. So we've got our kingdom, which is the very, very, very broad groups, uh, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom. And then we've got the phylum, the class, the order, the family, the genus, and the species. You know, the word specific uh, comes from the word species. It's the very, there's um, anything of one species, is, they're, they're all going to be the same. The genus would be a group of several like species and a family would be a, a group of many like genera. Now with the, uh, the earth stars, um, couldn't get very far because I don't know mushrooms all that well. Um, the kingdom there would be the fungi kingdom and we go on down from there. Uh, we might do this again sometime with something a little more familiar with where we can take it down to genus and species, but um, this is a, a handy way uh, to remember just how close you are to identifying an actual species. Um, some things like, um, oh gosh, some of our uh, wasps, uh, some of our beetles, you're, you're probably not going to get close, uh, you, you won't drill all the way down to species because you'd be looking at very tiny uh, microscopic parts. Um, but um, trying to aim for family when you're identifying something, that's a good goal. If you can get the genus, all the better. Um, and uh, we'll, we will probably um, revisit this little mnemonic device from time to time because it is a handy way to know just how specific you're getting in your identifications. But I don't want to bore you anymore. So we'll go on to the next thing, <laughs> which is angel wing. And I got to uh, thank Bob and Kathy Andrini for bringing this topic up. We've got a sad face by it because angel wing, even though it sounds lofty and noble, it's really not a great thing. Um, this was a picture I took a couple of years ago down at uh, Fabian Forest Preserve. Uh, if you look closely at these Canada geese, they don't look quite right. This one's wing is twisted out um, to the side. This one is also twisted out even more. Uh, what angel wing is, it's a condition that, honestly, it's, it's kind of uh, starting to be understood, but I think there's still some parts that we need to learn about because it doesn't affect all the geese, even though a lot of geese are subject to what we think the cause might be. Um, it doesn't appear to be uh, dietary. Um, but there might also be a genetic component, which would explain why not all the geese get this, but it seems to be related to the consumption of bread. And how many times haven't we seen people um, standing on a shoreline, you know, with a sack of, of bread and just tearing off chunks and feeding the ducks and the geese? Um, some birds, they start to eat that exclusively and um, it leads to a, a nutritional deficiency. They can even get metabolic bone disease, which is a lack of calcium. And it causes the birds. Now, birds don't have arms, but they do have um, analogous parts to their wings that we do in our, um, in our arms, our hands. Um, they have wrist bones and the, um, the dietary deficiencies can cause the wrist bones to kind of splay outward. And it causes, it's, it's an irreversible condition. If an adult uh, goose has angel wing, it's not going to be able to have its bones turn back in and grow normally. It's a, it's a permanent condition. It, it makes them so they can't fly anymore. Um, and it's something that uh, if, if they're wary enough and they can uh, you know, get out into the water to avoid predators and if they, they can live with it, but if they find themselves in a situation where it's fight or flight, um, flight isn't an option and they can only fight so much and then they, they don't survive. But um, the, uh, the best thing to do is to just leave them be. Um, if you spend much time around the Fox River or the surrounding areas, you know we are not short of geese. I snapped this photo one day as I was driving up to uh, the Nature Center, up to Hickory Knolls. This is one of our soccer fields. 
um, we've created a, ideal conditions for Canada geese because um, where they come from up in Canada, they graze on low growing plants like sedges. Well, down here we have low growing plants uh, called turf grass in our athletic fields, in our golf courses, in our parks. Um, so they're, they're not lacking for food by any means. Around here, they also have the added benefit of uh, farm fields. Uh, they, they feed on the, uh, the corn and the soybean, the spilled grains that uh, occur during a harvest. Uh, so they don't really need any help from us. If you do it, it is, it is fun. I'll admit, you know, it's fun to, to, to you know, see, um, you know, feel like you're helping wildlife. Um, Will County had uh, produced um, a document that listed some suggestions for uh, foods you can feed uh, to geese. Uh, chopped greens, uh, mealworms, uh, either fresh or freeze-dried, and then freeze-dried crickets, our grain products, barley, uh, oats, oatmeal, um, bird seeds, cracked corn. You can take your vegetable scraps because these guys do eat a lot of plant matter, and then grapes, but they specified chopped grapes because whole grapes uh, actually can be a choking hazard as they are for little kids. They can also choke the geese. And if you're trying to do the right thing and prevent angel wing and still have some fun by feeding these wild animals, uh, you don't want to mess up and choke them. So make sure if you're going to feed them some grapes that you chop them up first. And what's a good nature show without a good healthy dose of uh, look out, danger, Will Robinson. Uh, this is your, your weekly warning that um, it's yellow jacket season. Uh, the other day I was out in the native plant garden behind Potawatomi. I was actually, I was taking some pictures of uh, the, uh, some Solomon seal berries, I think. And I just happened to look down. I, I, I was sort of aware that there were some insects buzzing around. And then I, oops, I looked down and um, a lot of activity right by this hole underneath this leaf. And um, I was really happy that I noticed it before I took one more step forward because uh, it was a yellow jacket nest. Uh, yellow jackets are, uh, they're wasps, and um, we've got a couple of different types around here. This looks to be the eastern yellow jacket, which is the native form. There's also the German yellow jacket, which is a little bit larger. Um, look, at, look at how much coming and going there is right now. Um, they are nearing the end of their annual life cycle. Uh, they're that their queens, if they haven't already left, next year's queens haven't left the nest, the colony, they will be soon. Those queens are going to overwinter somewhere underneath a log and some leaf litter. And then um, next spring they'll go and they will start their own colonies. Everything that's in the existing colonies right now is not going to survive. Um, around here, the, the native, um, Eastern yellow jackets tend to nest in the ground. The German yellow jackets are sometimes in the ground. They're also a lot of times in wood. You see them in uh, landscape timbers. I know at Potawatomi, we had quite a large colony living in the uh, railroad ties that were stabilizing uh, some of the soil over by the pool at Potawatomi. Um, German yellow jackets were actually introduced to this country, they think, in loads of wood that came over from Germany. So. Uh, not to say that they won't nest in the ground, but they do have a preference for nesting in, in um, decaying wood, whereas the eastern yellow jackets go down on the ground. They usually um, will take advantage of an abandoned rodent burrow, uh, chipmunk burrow in this case. Um, I found this one a couple of weeks ago too. Again, I was um, walking along and I just sort of became aware of a lot of flying insects in, in one spot. Now, um, you know, sometimes that can indicate you know, that it's flies and there's you know, something that a dog left behind. You want to avoid that too. But just if, if you can be aware of your surroundings as you're walking around and if you notice eh, um, a lot of activity in one area. Now this one, I was, I was kind of far away when I noticed it. And then I, 
got in a little bit closer and uh, this is cell phone camera work so it's not great but see this character right here that's a guard a lot of times um, with, with most of our youth social wasp they will host uh, guards near the entrance um, to their colony to their hive to their nest and um, this one for whatever reason decided that i wasn't that much of a threat so it didn't send out an alarm and they didn't come after me but um, that is a way that they communicate um, with each other and that's why you get that rapid response um, of any of you who have ever stepped on a, a yellow jacket nest know that they don't um, look at them piling in there they don't waste a lot of time they are um, kind of hell-bent on protecting uh, all their colony mates, which in this time of year can number in the, uh, the thousands. Um, the colony is also starting to change. Their queen is um, producing fewer eggs because she's nearing the end of her life cycle. And um, so there's not as many larvae for the uh, adults uh, to take care of. So this is the time of year when if, if you're trying to eat outside, you'll see you've got yellow jackets buzzing around your sandwich. You'll have yellow jackets trying to get inside your pop. Um, they, uh, are, they're uh, changing because they, they, they don't have as many. Um, the young wasp, the, the wasp larvae, they also, um, they produce a sweet liquid for the uh, workers that are bringing them food is kind of a like a, almost like a little reward because there's fewer larvae these adult wasps are not getting that sweet reward so they're looking in other sources for it which could be uh, your can of pop uh, or your bottle of beer so do be careful even if you're not out walking around and you're not seeing birds piling into uh, holes in the ground be careful of what you're drinking out of too because um, until we get a, a good hard frost these guys are going to be uh, very active you might be thinking well you know let's just nuke them all why do we even need them well what yellow everything has a job to do and the yellow jackets job is to eat other insects um, that's what they feed the larva um, they uh, capture it's usually uh, small flies um, sometimes caterpillars, um, and they, they masticate, they chew those up with their mouth parts, they bring them in and they feed those to the larva. So, so they do provide a, a valuable service. The other thing, and I've had two different people now tell me that they had yellow jacket nests that were dug up. These nests are also food for animals. Uh, skunks dig them up, raccoons dig them up. Uh, they feed on the, the larvae that are underneath the ground. Even if um, nothing digs the nest up, uh, as we go from fall to winter, those uh, larvae underneath the ground can be um, a source of food for those animals. Uh, skunks kind of tend to lay low as we get into the, the cold, cold winter months, but raccoons, unless it's super cold out, they do remain active. So. Um, if it's at all, if you do know of a yellow jacket nest and it's somewhere that it's not going to be a hazard to you or, or others, um, I urge you to leave it because um, everything does have a job to do, even yellow jackets. Plus, um, you can save uh, pouring uh, poisonous chemicals into the ground, which isn't always a good idea either. So uh, with that, we're going to uh, wrap up by saying that I'm going to try a little experiment next week. I'm going to be out of town for a few days, um, going up to um, our family's cabin up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. This is uh, over here on the right. This is the cabin that uh, my Uncle Hubie and Aunt Ginny built in the 1950s in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It's, it's funny, it's the UP but it's the southern UP, so it's it's actually not as far north as even, say, Eagle River, um, Hayward, Wisconsin. This is in the southeast portion of the UP. It's right on the Menominee River, and uh, we all have our special spots on this planet, and, and this is one of mine. This river, I, I can't count the number of summers that I spent up here waiting in this water, sitting on that rock right there. Um, so the, the cabin is, is near the town of Stevenson, Michigan. 
and it's it's uh, the cabin though is, is in a pretty remote location uh, there's no internet there in fact it just got a landline phone uh, not too many years ago so I'm gonna go over I have a cousin that lives um, near the town of Stevenson who actually has uh, Wi-Fi so I'm gonna try to broadcast live from the UP it'll probably be something without slides I'm gonna uh, try to recreate what we've been able to find in the, the few days that I've been up there uh, but there's uh, so much life in this river that I want to share with you the uh, um, the macro invertebrates that live underneath the rocks this they've got stone flies up there the, the caddis flies there's um, a tremendous diversity of freshwater mussels in this uh, Menominee River so um, that's what's on the docket for next week and um, hope you're able to join us hope I'm able to join you I don't know what the Wi-Fi in, in Stevenson Michigan is going to Michigan is going to be like but that's the plan and I uh, hope I see you then. And with that, I'm gonna stop the share. I'm gonna find out if anybody has any questions. And, or anything you've seen this week that uh, you've been curious about. I sent you a couple chat questions. Oh, let's. Um, how do you tell a boy from a girl mantis? Oh, that is a great, and have we ever made it? Okay, so. It's size, and it's also the number of abdominal segments. Now, um, I want to say that the female has more, and I'm thinking the number 12, but I would have to double check on that. But um, if you're seeing a, a, a mantid that's um, six inches or larger at this time, it's a male, a female. And if you're seeing something that's smaller than that, that's maybe, um, you know, the, the length of your, your middle finger or so, then you know you're looking at a, a, a male. Now that I'm saying that, it could be a male that has the, uh, the greater number of segments. I can double check on that and let you know, Sarah, but size is the big giveaway. Um, and then have we ever had a native species here? I don't think so. The Carolina mantis is the species here in Illinois and it stops a little bit south of here. Now things are always shifting and some of our more southern species have been uh, you know, creeping farther north so it could be someday we will have the Carolina mantis here which will cause a whole other um, you know, re-education for all of us interpreters out there because we're so used to saying, oh, it's not native. but um, uh, it, it, right now, it, we do not have the Carolina mantis here in King County. Anybody else? Well, Pam, it's, I feel like one of my students because it's not a question. It's kind of a story. <laughs> a story. <laughs> I have a story, Miss Pam. <laughs> but you were sorry. But you were talking about the yellow jackets, and I was um, uh, talking with my friends over at Wild Rose School a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the situation has changed so much at school where they can't have their snacks in their classroom anymore. So they okay. go outside and they spread out a towel and they have their snack. Um, okay. They're also utilizing parts uh, of the school grounds that aren't normally utilized, like in front of uh, the Wild Rose building, which is normally kind of damp and wet, but uh, it had been dry. So at any rate, um, the the whole third grade four sections of them went down um uh into an area that's not normally used by the school and one poor little girl set her uh her towel oh, right oh. on top of a yellow jacket nest. oh shoot and unfortunately um she froze <gasps> and, and uh luckily one of the teachers went into some sort of mom hyper mode <laughs> Just, just went and grabbed her and 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 ran. Um, and uh, the teacher only had six or seven stings, but the poor little girl had had some more. I mean, she she did okay. She had to go to the doctors and and and, and everything. But it just makes me think, you know, uh, you know how unexpected it can be. Yeah. And, yeah. So um, and then to try and um, educate people that they're not all bad. Uh, it's yeah it's an uphill well yeah. there's even there's all those memes out there now now where they 
you know, they've got, you know, the, the cute fuzzy little honeybee. Yeah. And they've got the yellow jacket and they call them nature's, you know, <laughs> starts with A. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's, yeah, that's where if you can, just like, you know, when we were talking about training your eye to look for the mantis egg cases, if you can train your eye to just be aware of, you know, activity near the ground. We had a similar thing happen, Laura, during a, um, it wasn't, it was not a field trip with Hickory Knolls. It was a, a, a high school class that had come out to use the natural area as like a laboratory. Uh -huh. Observations and things like that. And a girl set her backpack down mm. Yes. Mm. and um, angered quite a few oh. of the yellow jackets. And when she went to pick the backpack up, it was like oh. she lit off a can of them and they just kind of, oh, oh yeah. And went yeah. After. Um, I did notice um, uh, this was a few weeks. In fact, I think I did put a slide on here where uh, there was a yellow jacket nest in the parkway where I was walking the dogs and somebody had written it with sidewalk chalk, bees, with an arrow. Yeah. <laughs> and then they put a bucket over the nest and then somebody had put what looked like mothballs around it. Oh, geez. And um, I went back with a piece of sidewalk chalk and I crossed out bees and I wrote wasps. <laughs> <laughs> And then I don't know if somebody then came back because the bucket is gone and the yellow jackets are gone too. So uh, somebody must yeah. have taken matters into their own hand. Yeah. Okay. I promise I won't tell any more stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of promise. <laughs> okay. Right. Oh, now, always love a good story, Laura. Um, ah, here we go. Um, so uh, is this you, Betty? Um, I've been raising a few Chinese mantids this summer. The female has six abdominal segments and the male has eight. Yay! So there we go. Oh, let's unmute you. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. Yeah, I, um, I ordered um, some um, man Chinese mantid egg cases early on and was lucky enough to actually see one of them hatch oh, and um, it was exciting so then i released all of them except for tan uh -huh. and of course you have, to, you have to keep them in separate containers uh -huh. and then eventually i started releasing you know one here one there um but i've become really attached yeah <laughs> 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 and um and actually um let's see the lighting's not very good here. wait hold on i can probably show you one if you want oh show and tell yeah yeah you know what yeah hold on let me turn the light on sure well you know i remember uh, one day at the nature center a fella came in and, and he had one on his finger that was his pet and he brought it you know some people you know take their dogs with them he took his pet mantis with him on you know his walk he said he thought it would be good to get it outside and let it have some fresh air and some sunshine and then he said that um he's gotten them to live because i i always thought they had a you know limited life expectancy um, and he said that they can live longer than you think as long as they have enough water look at this so he would actually take a little spoon and and I I went and got one so I could watch and he he held the spoon. Oh. <laughs> it's so is um, this a boy or a girl we're looking at? Well, uh, you know, I think I think they're both uh, the two that I've left. I think they're both females. But even though I know and I've been reading and and it's still really difficult to see. Uh huh. Um and. So I've been, initially I was, fee this, okay, this one was born, whoopsie, <laughs> just jumped on the, the screen. This one was uh, born on July 1st. Oh. And, um, and the other one is about the same size. Um, the, these two are also uh, larger too, so that's why another reason I think they're females. They're females, okay. Uh, but, but anyway, when you, Oops. When you look at the segments, you have to look at the underside 
which of okay. course is very, di very difficult. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm still working on the, the sexing of them. I'll let you know maybe next week. <laughs> well, I remember when we had little Manny, I, I remember trying to count and it, yeah, it's not easy. And we went by his size. And then the fact that he didn't produce a, an egg case. Now, last year we raised one and she was never, um, uh, she never was with the male. So she didn't produce a fertile egg case. She just made this tiny little blob here, um, it looks like a really tiny toasted marshmallow. Um, and she, she, she's per, pretty yeah. lively here. Um, <laughs> so when I, what I started doing was initially was feeding them fruit flies. Okay. And um, for those of you that um, have never had that much fun with fruit flies. That was much worse than the, the mantids. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the fruit flies, you can purchase uh, um, wingless fruit mm -hmm. flies at the pet store. And so I did that for a while, but that that was really, really annoying because the, the food that um, is used to keep the fruit flies alive is has a horrible odor. Yes. And, um, and it's hard to, to Con control the number that you would give the um, the praying mantis. So, um, you know, and it, as I said, initially I had 10 of them, but it was just too much work. Uh, now I'm feeding them crickets and that's okay. much easier. Okay. Because crickets I can pick up with uh, um, some tweezers and, you know, make sure that they get that. But the most important thing is that I um, I have to spray water I like missed the side of the the habitat each day because they get water from droplets on the side of the um, of the container, okay. and th that's even more important than the food. Yeah, and um, that, that just seems like um, anytime I've kept insects, and it doesn't have to be a, a praying mantis. It could uh, I've had beetles, I've had uh, cockroaches, and um, they uh, that our indoor environments tend to have less humidity, and it really right hold on them. Um, and yeah, that that uh, I remember little Manny. I would watch him, and he, and he would press his face up, you know, and then the the droplet on the glass would disappear as he slurped it up. Uh, they are. They make great pets, and you can find. I, I, I've never done it before, um, and I I've always wanted to try it, um, but because I also um, do monarch butterflies, I was afraid that you know they would. If oh I, gosh, if you I wouldn't want to have one experiment eat the other one. <laughs> I know. If I had a lot of praying mantises in the yard, that they would eat the caterpillars. So okay. so anyway, but this year I decided I would do it, and, and it was basically for the grandkids, uh -huh. and. Um, and everybody got their own little pet and got to name them and everything. Um, anyway, it's it's pretty easy and it was extreme. It's been extremely fun. Really, so really I would I would recommend trying it just 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 to do it and and learn about these fascinating animals. That's great. Well, there's the endorsement. <laughs> yeah, I remember as a child I used to um, collect um, praying mantis uh, egg cases. Well, and, <laughs> I know, I know. He's he's or she is uh, not not happy at all now. Um, and I I remember a story. So I've always been attached to this little this type of insect. I remember over spring break, I left a praying mantis. I was in fourth grade. I left a praying praying mantis egg case in my desk, and oh. when I came back after spring break it had hatched and there were 200 at least little <laughs> insects running all over the classroom and my my teacher was um you know very well put together single and she i could tell she didn't she was not happy at all with me <laughs> she pushed me and my out into the hallway <laughs> <laughs> so i've always had a special place in my heart for these little guys <laughs> oh sure <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Well, you know, I, and whether you or anybody that's considering raising these in the future, um, cricket, like you mentioned, the, the little tiny fruit flies, I actually have um, a, a lot of 
feeder cockroaches. And I know when you hear the word cockroaches, you think, what, what are you thinking? These aren't the pest species. They're not the Germans, they're not the American cockroach, they're not the Asian cockroach. They're, they are, um, uh, they're called uh, uh, dubia roaches. You buy them, uh, you can buy a little starter colony to you know, feed your reptiles. But um, if any of you are looking for feeder insects, let me know because I've got a whole bin of, and I, I don't have anything to feed them right now. So if you want some to feed your mantises, let me know. Because uh, Thank you. Oh, you know, the other interesting thing about the mantids is that they, um, they molt about 10 times until they okay. become adults. adults. And the molting process is quite interesting because their whole, you know, the whole skin comes off. Yeah. It looks like a, a, another mantid in the, in the habitat with them. And then they're also really limp for a couple of days and they don't eat. Until they get that. And, uh, yeah, and they, they kind of shake. And, and uh, in fact, a couple of times I've thought they were dead. And then, you know, the next day they were fine. So, um, oh, and the other thing, I, I think I put it in the post, but um, besides the segments, the, ver the very bottom segment, again, you're looking at the underside, uh -huh. uh, on the female is larger because that's the egg laying feature okay. of the of the mantid. So to me, that's a little bit easier even, even than counting the segments. Excellent. And you can't, you can't count the segments until they're, I think, the fourth or fifth instar. Okay. So like when they're really little, you can't tell. You've got, at this age, we should be able to tell. But I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm still kind of struggling with the... <laughs> with this well, part of it. It's, it sounds like we've all got a homework assignment now this week. Go out, find a mantis, <laughs> practice counting the segments, see if you can find that larger segment at the end. Tell the boys from the girls. That's awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, you know what? Maybe we'll make show and tell a part of Good Natured in the Future because there's always cool things that I know you guys are saying out there. I, I was just commenting to somebody the other day, I, I don't get out as much as I need to. So um, maybe you guys can be my eyes and ears for what's going on as well. Um, does, does anybody else have anything this evening? Uh, oh, Chris, we got you muted there. What did you say? Oh. Say that again, Chris. Oh. No. So Pam, yeah. um, we yeah. obviously had yellow jackets in our yard uh, along some boulders, and now there's a mammoth hole in there. Does that mean a skunk went after them? Yes. Yeah, are they not, um, is there little, uh, is there less activity now? Okay. Yeah, it's pretty well slowed down. Okay, yeah. And, and so now you're the third person that has had a nest uh, predated. And it, it, it's, it's a great, if, if the animal that's digging up the nest can uh, withstand the stings, um, and a lot of times this happens at night when the colony is less reactive, you know, in the, in the day, and there's a lot of comings and goings, but at night, pretty much everybody's down in there, um, you know, waiting till it gets light out again. So um, uh, that's, and I wonder, you know, how many of our uh, local wildlife species are figuring that out, that, you know, there's free food to be had just by uh, digging a hole and maybe getting a few stings. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very good chance it was a skunk, huh? I would say skunk or raccoon. Um, I don't really see a possum digging like that, but I, I, I saw, uh, this was a few years ago, but um, there was a raccoon that was digging. Um, it, it, I scared it away and I, the, the nest itself wasn't active anymore maybe something else had come to it first and the maybe a skunk started it and a, and a raccoon finished it but i think those two and, and not to say that you know a, a coyote or a fox wouldn't try either but i I've, I've seen dogs try it and get stung pretty good so 
Um, skunks don't have a lot of exposed skin. They've got a tiny little nose and everything else is covered with fur. So, and they've got those, they're well adapted for digging. They've got really long claws and it's, it's kind of what they're made to do. So that's, that's kind of who I suspect is doing it. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, and they are more active this time of year maybe. Yeah, yeah, get ready. Yeah, because the skunks of, of I call them the big three: skunks, opossums, and raccoons. They're the the, um, the the larger mammals that live around people very very closely. And um, of those three, the skunk is is probably the the least active. Skunk uh, raccoons are the most active, and opossums would rather not be active because they've got poor fur, they've got bare ears, bare nose, a bare tail, bare feet. They're not well adapted to winter, but they, so oftentimes they have to come out and find something to eat. That's when we see them around our bird feeders in winter time. <laughs> but, um, Great, thank you. <laughs> sure. Oh, is that it? I think that's it for tonight. Well, everyone, thank you so much. Great to see y'all, and uh, fingers crossed, uh, I'll be joining you next week from up in the UP. Yeah, cool. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Pam. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, guys. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks.